no one explains that to you that if when your audience grows to a certain a size people will look for things to pin on you and try to destroy you Lloyd Evans many people will know who you are you are like the guy of Jehovah's Witnesses. You're like the guy online um, of, sorry, of leaving Jehovah's Witnesses, I should say. That's a huge, very... Yeah, I, I don't represent them. I'm not like the leader of the religion or anything. Oh my God, that reminds me of when I said to Richard Dawkins that he was known for um, writing about religion. And he went, no, no, I'm known for writing about science. Yeah. <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, yes, Lloyd Evans of the XJWs, which is the Jehovah's Witnesses, um... Yeah, why don't you tell viewers who don't know and listeners who don't know a little bit about uh, you and what you've been doing on YouTube and how you've built up an audience uh, and, and then what's happened over the last few months. I'll let you sort of take it away. Gosh, um, yeah, well, I, I grew up, well, I've, I've been interviewed by you before. So that's that. If, if viewers kind of want more of a backstory, you very kindly uh, interviewed me about that. And yes, I grew up as a Jehovah's Witness and... Um, when I was 30, I around about 30, I moved to Croatia and it was moving to Croatia because I met a Croatian woman, um, my wife, Diana. It was moving to Croatia that basically led to me waking up to the fact that I was in a cult um, because I was attending the local Jehovah's Witness meetings here in Croatia and realized that uh, well, well, I didn't understand any of it. <laughs> so I was sat in the Kingdom Hall, you know, hearing these talks in this other language, and it just gave me the space to think, hang on a minute, do, do I believe this? And to cut a long story short, uh, I ended up snapping out of my indoctrination and realizing that not only had I been lied to for most of my life, but also this is actually quite an abusive group. Um, with a terrible track record in the cover-up of child sexual abuse and, you know, lives ruined over shunning and people persuaded to die rather than accepting blood. And so I started doing activism. I wrote a book called The Reluctant Apostate. I started a website called jwsurvey.org, now jwwatch.org. And in 2012, I started uploading YouTube videos and as of the last few months, my channel has grown to over 100,000 subscribers. So it's, yeah, it, th there's been enormous interest in the subject that I'm talking about, and it has led to me growing a large audience. But what I've learned, especially over the last few weeks, is that when you grow a large audience, you also become incredibly vulnerable. And it's not something that when you start out on YouTube, you know, there's no kind of small print where it's like, by the way, if you get big, this might happen. What do you think it was about about you in particular? Because there were quite a few XJWs. What do you think it was about you in particular that, that led to your channel growth? Well, there were other ex-Jehovah's Witness channels when I started, and there are many, many now. Um, I don't want to, I, I, I hate kind of <laughs> being accused of talking myself up. Um, I suppose that um, my experience within the organization as an elder and as someone who, uh, for example, I went to a, a special school called the Ministerial Training School. Um, it's like a two month course where they they drill you on the various teachings and what have you. I guess I was, well-informed um, and my experience within the organization and seeing various facets of the organization um, probably helped me to pick apart the teachings and the propaganda um, effectively or you know more effectively than than what people might expect I don't know I, I hate I hate to kind of talk myself up in that way but for whatever reason you know, the videos resonated. Um, and what's also happened as well is that from 2014 onwards, the organization has become more geared towards producing video propaganda so that there's now just this constant barrage of um, very 
coercive material coming out of Jehovah's Witnesses, which, of course, when you're a YouTuber and a YouTube commentator, gives you no shortage of material to be talking about. So I, I am not spoilt for choice when it comes to, you know, thinking of topics to discuss because I've, I've got more material coming at me or Jehovah's Witnesses, I should say, have more material coming at them than I can possibly even begin to stay on top of. And so it grew to a huge, huge channel uh, and you became, you know, synonymous with Jehovah's Witnesses. That's that's your thing. And, and most people, you know, maybe not in the audio podcast world, but in the YouTube world, certainly people know who Lloyd Evans is. Um, and then things have started to take a bit of a, well, things have been up and down over the last few months regarding your mental health and all sorts of different things coming out on Twitter. Allegations are being made. Legal proceedings are being talked about. What happened? Uh, I, I want to go back to what I believe was a core, because we're going to talk about cyberbullying and that's that's what I want to talk about today, but obviously people need to know where this comes from. Um, there was a call that you, you had, I believe, and tell me if I'm wrong about this, this is just what I've heard, with Kim and Bob, who are your producers. So take me back to that moment and, and so I can hear your side of, of what went on. Um, I think you might be talking about, so this was way back in, in December, I think around about the 16th. Um, I had a, a call with them because um, for quite a few days, I think a couple of weeks, you know, my wife and I had been um, dealing with basically my infidelity to her. She, My wife had discovered that I'd been unfaithful. And so, you know, that led to very difficult conversations, obviously, between me and my wife. And... Um, yeah, it's a very, very stressful time, you know, in any kind of relationship, um, when there is infidelity or any kind of issues of that kind where you're, you're wondering whether you need to get divorced, there are children involved. It was an incredibly stressful time. And it just reached a point where, because I was working with various people, um, two individuals who I was working with most closely, um, Kim Silvio and producer Bob. Very important to call producer Bob producer Bob because it's a synonym, and their anonymity their anonymity needs to be preserved. Um, I just felt it was important to bring them up to speed on what was happening behind the scenes, and um, I have to say that they were incredibly supportive. Um, I was actually kind of surprised at how supportive they were. I was thinking, wow, I'm, I'm really, you know, making myself vulnerable here and, and showing the very worst side of myself, albeit to people I work with closely who are my friends. But, you know, they could potentially take this really badly and, you know, say, I, you know, I want nothing more to do with you. You know, you've, you've, you've unveiled yourself to be an undesirable person to work with. So we're calling it quits, but they didn't do that. They instead, we, we set up um, a meltdown support group is what we called it. Um, because the, the truth is that I was in a very fragile state with my mental health. I didn't know what was going to happen in my life. Um, and so they decided to basically support me and um, and help and help me through it. And that's basically where everything, I guess, really started to go wrong. Because while the problems in my marriage were a, a whole level of difficult and challenging to to unravel, um, what's really provided the most stress, I would say, over the last few weeks is the fact that. The things that I shared confidentially were ended up being blasted online, but not just the fact that my confidence got violated. It was the fact that a whole bunch of stuff was said about me and my private life and my work that just isn't true. And that again, you, you know, you're it's hard enough dealing with the reality of it. But to have to actually explain to people, no, actually, this didn't happen, and no, that didn't happen, 
it, it, it's so, so difficult to navigate through that. So we should set the record straight then. And I, I would say, I think you are on the right podcast to talk about this because, I mean, the, I, I, for me, it's all about no moralizing, no thinking that I wouldn't have done the same as other people in their situations. I've had uh, pe- pedophiles on here. I've had psychopath murderers. So, and, and I find people often get most annoyed by things that are not the same as murder, they, the, the things that they can imagine that they might have done but didn't. I feel that that's what winds people up a lot. Um, at the same time, you know, we need to g- get to what happened. And, and obviously, you know, allegations are and i think you've i think you've admitted to this that that it wasn't just extramarital affairs it was it was uh prostitution is that right so it yeah well i didn't want to have any relationships outside of my marriage so yes it was um and just to be absolutely clear um it was prostitution leading up to uh you know before the conversation took place in in december so yeah that it was with um sex workers that i was unfaithful with my wife yeah and look a lot of people are unfaithful with their wives uh with sex workers uh, and i think the the issue that a lot of the community have of course is that you've been a leading advocate uh against sort of sex trafficking and that kind of thing um and that you had sort of a moral duty i suppose as the leader and the face of the jehovah's witnesses uh to take care in that aspect especially because of course many sex workers in what i believe it was croatia and thailand um will have been sex trafficked well i'm not a leader um i'm a i'm a guy who talks about a religion so and i i think this is like this is where kind of words matter because I've never ever, in fact, I think I've even put out a video in the early days saying you shouldn't have leaders. I'm not a leader. I'm not a moral authority. I'm a guy who knows something about this particular religion and I want to share my knowledge. So I've never um, presented myself as perfect. I've never never presented myself as any kind of moral authority, and I've certainly never presented myself as a leader. Uh, I and I yes, you're right. I am an advocate against the cover up of child sexual abuse. So, if people want to d- draw lines between the cover up of child sexual abuse, which is where children get abused, and the perpetrators aren't held accountable or get to evade justice and sex workers, then, you know, they can do that if they like. But in my view, there's a huge, huge difference. And so what's happened is, and I I hate to kind of sound like all woe is me because I'm very mindful of, of the fact that we're having this conversation in the context of a country at the moment that's being blown to pieces and children being bombed and that kind of thing. You know, I I consider myself incredibly lucky in the context of everything that's going on at the moment that, you know, my life's pretty, pretty damn good. But I think that, that, that there's a, there's a very, it's very easy to slide from whistleblowing. Whistleblowing is crucial into bullying. And I think it, I think a conversation, a conversation needs to be had about When does it stop being whistleblowing? And when does it actually start being bullying? So when are you when are you no longer giving legitimate criticism of an individual? When are you instead um, bullying an individual by shaming him over his private life, even though he hasn't actually done anything wrong? You're just trying to draw lines and and pin something on him that he's not responsible for. And I, I feel as though, again, that's that's the side of being a, a YouTuber, a creator, a public figure, call it what you will. No one explains that to you, that if when your audience grows to a certain size, people will look for things to pin on you and try to destroy you. And particularly when it comes to YouTube, you get no protection at all. So people can now go on on the YouTube search bar and type in Lloyd Evans, and a whole slew of videos are going to come up of people talking about my private life 
and saying a whole bunch of things that just are not true. And they're trying to make a name for themselves, some of them as well. Oh, it's it, it it's really been incredibly stressful and challenging. Um, again, I'm, I, I try not to over-dramatize things because, I, again, I think both of us... <laughs> Um, are very very fortunate. Well, well, Lloyd, we we are, but you know, look, people people kill themselves who are not at war. You know, um, people people can be very depressed with nothing wrong in their lives. So, what you're going through does sound incredibly difficult. I've seen the barrages, and I've seen that. I think you make a really really good point as well about the conflation of words and the fact that we and this is this is on this podcast a lot. We talk about this a lot that we want to punish. Uh, we have this need to punish rather than, for example, reform or, uh, you know, so that's what whistleblowing is, is about. You whistleblow because you want maybe the the act to stop or you want, you know, the criminal act or what if there is a criminal act or you want that person to be reformed or put away or taken, you know, not to be a danger to society anymore. But really, a lot of us like to punish. So when somebody sees someone like you, you know, on the pedestal and you do something that they see as morally not right, they, they want to knock you down. And they also... Um, will change words and you're right there is a, it's there's such a huge difference between child sexual abuse and you know having sex with sex workers so conflating those terms makes things worse and then as a group mentality i've seen that tribal reaction on twitter and people having a go so but but what one thing i would sort of uh uh maybe take issue with is is that you're not a leader and i i say that fully aware of my own status as a as a podcast host I just did a um, a course for YouTube, some like two hundred pound course or whatever, where you learn how to whatever uh, be a good YouTuber, and it's it's like a reputable one that helps people grow their YouTube subscribers. And it was like day, like every day was a different lesson for thirty days, and it was like day twenty creation story. So what's your creation story? Day twenty one was creed. You have to have a creed. Day twenty two icons. The next day was rituals. The next day was sacred words. Uh, and the next day was non-believers. So this idea of you know you have to you have to say that you you weren't getting into a cult, were you? It sounds like you were <laughs> joining some kind of cult. <laughs> uh, this is what I'm getting at. Is I, and and the last the last uh, page was was leader. How to become a leader. And I've seen your channel, and and you do a lot of these things. So do I. So does you know Sean Atwood, whose channel I go on. We all do them, whether consciously or not. And after years and years of doing them, you are a leader, especially if you are your channel is is the, the vast majority of your subscribers have come in from a very vulnerable position of being in a cult and might have that intuition of looking for a leader in that sense. So whether you wanted to or not, I would say that you, you did become a leader and maybe that gave you some sort of extra responsibility. I don't know. I think to, I, to a degree, I would agree with you. I think that it's like Spider-Man, with great power comes great responsibility um i i think that when you have a platform you you do have added responsibility and i think that there's been um lots of conversation along those lines when you look at for example you know the joe rogan podcast and certain things that have been said on joe rogan's show that some would argue in the context of for example advice on covid uh, are irresponsible. So, but then we're talking about, well, what has this person used his his platform to say? What has this person used his, his profile um, and his authority to, to encourage people to do? And, and again, when I look at, you, you know, even if you want to say, well, you're, you know, you have a large platform, therefore you, you have, some kind of responsibility. I accept that, but you know, judge me on my words because I'm not going to be going on my YouTube channel telling people to drink horse dewormer or telling people to, you know, do things that are detrimental to their to their health or well-being. I, I accept my responsibility in that direction. I just don't think that being a public person means that I'm not entitled to a private life anymore and that I, I, I deserve to have, you know, personal things that I have nothing, uh, are no one's business but that of my, myself and my wife. Oh, well, therefore, we need to talk about that because what he did in this department of his life 
is objectionable. I, I, I don't accept that, if that makes sense. So I, 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 I am on board with you that people with large platforms have a responsibility. I just think that there's a limitation when it comes to what we can reasonably expect of a fallible human being when it comes to their private lives. I think I think a lot of people would agree with you. And again, I just I, I want to constantly reiterate that I, I don't intend to judge and I definitely don't think I, I wouldn't have done the same thing and all of that thing. But I am trying to look into why a lot of the community are so uh, angry. And I suppose when you say judge me by my words, they, they might respond, judge me, well, I'll judge you by your actions. Uh, and of course, there has to be a limit as, as I get what you're saying about the private life but also I mean what if you what if you killed someone what if you did there has to be at some point where people go hang on and they think that you crossed that line you don't think you did you must have been aware with the sex workers that a lot of these would have been trafficked as children and, and that that did that is a sort of goes against something that's very important to you which is the protection of 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 child sex trafficking and that kind of thing right so I've I've only ever had sex with consenting adults. I, I don't mean to, I'm not in, intending otherwise. I, I, I understand people's concerns about sex trafficking and, and, and that kind of thing, but you know, all, ultimately the bottom line is, are we talking about sex between consenting adults or are we not talking about sex between consenting adults? Well, we, I suppose with prostitution, it's a, it's a blurry line with, with regards to consent and where, and where that, you know, we, we don't know. That's that's the truth of it. You couldn't possibly you couldn't know a Thai prostitute. And a well, I I I dated a sex worker in Thailand, but this is the thing that a lot has been said on YouTube, where it's not based on anything I've said, and it's not even based on things that Kim Silvio have said. People have just raced to conclusions based on the fact that I went to Thailand. There are okay. You're referring to to rumors. That are just, that, I mean, that's hearsay, isn't it? And I didn't want to bring any of that, and we don't have to talk about that. I, I don't want you to think that I'm uh, accusing anything like that. I, I'm not at all. I'm just trying to understand why why other people might be, if or your followers might be offended with with regards to adult sex workers. I, I feel like the majority of my followers, based on, um, for example, because I see the stats, I, I've seen the the likes and dislikes on my videos. And I feel like the vast majority of my followers understand that I am a flawed individual. I, I never uh, presented myself as perfect. And they understand that I'm entitled to a private life and that my privacy has been violated. I think what, what tends to happen, especially on Twitter, is that a, a minority who basically want to see someone burn um are so vocal that they almost look like they're they they might be the majority but i, I don't think they are i think that it, it's basically like a mob rule situation where you know we've decided that this individual um needs to be destroyed and and that's again where i think a line is crossed between it stops being about whistleblowing it stops being about accountability and it starts being about bullying because I am happy to answer to any accusation uh, regarding anything I may have done or may not have done. But I draw the line at people saying things about me that just aren't true. I mean, I've, ha I've had Andrew all sorts of stuff said about child grooming, about wife beating, at one point, people were calling for social services to come and uh, take me away from my children. You know, th this is this is clearly bullying. It's not about oh, you know, we're, we're providing a service to people. We're we're holding an individual accountable. It's we've decided that this person should no longer exist as an activist. It sounds like cancel culture. I actually. I have fairly nuanced views about cancel culture. I think that I, I prefer the word um, consequence culture. I think that when you do wrong things, there should be consequences. But you, but you personally, and I'm not saying you are, but you don't think you did you did anything wrong. That's the issue. I, right? I think I think I did do something wrong. I think that I was unfaithful to my wife, and I think that I had sex with consenting adults who were not my wife. 
and that's what I did wrong. And But that's an issue between me and my wife, which, by the way, has, has been so much harder to navigate and so much harder to deal with with all of the defamation and all of the bullying and all of the, you know, basically the witch hunt that's been going on with Twitter has made it so much harder to navigate those those deeply difficult and challenging personal issues that I'm having with my wife. So yes, I have made mistakes, but nowhere near on the level that people are are trying to make out. And I, I just I just think it, it's wrong. I think bullying is wrong. I've, I've never, I've never um, handled bullies very well. I, it's kind of the reason why I do my activism against Jehovah's Witnesses because they, in my mind, are bullies, and I won't let them bully me. And I'm sure as hell not going to let a bunch of people who think that I should no longer exist as an activist. I'm not going to let them bully me either. It's just kind of in my DNA to to push back against that sort of thing. I gather that some of your followers are sort of a little torn because of course there are the extreme people who are bullying and then there are people who are very supportive and then some are a bit torn and they're a bit upset. I, and 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 some seem to have been saying that that the problem for them, that for them is that you haven't taken any you won't say you did apart aside from what you did, you know, to your wife which I agree with you that's a private matter and that is none of our business quite frankly. Uh but with regards to the 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 prostitution and stuff, given your status, it's that, that that you won't at all back down and say, I don't think it's as bad as some people say, but it is bad in some respects. I think some people were hoping there'd be some apology in that sense. I think lots of people have been wanting apologies. Uh, I just absolutely maintain that I, again, <laughs> hate to have to stress it again, but I have only ever in my 42 years had sex with consenting adults and that's the end of the matter and um although i'm sure lots of people are disappointed to hear that i am a flawed individual and that i have um been unfaithful to my wife i'm sure that that comes as a huge disappointment especially in the context of a community that you know has basically in many cases, grown up in a in a in a culture of sexual repression, where all of these things are incredibly taboo, I can understand why lots of people feel very disappointed, even to the point where they may feel like I owe them personally an, an apology. But I take apologies very seriously. It's actually those who know me well know that I actually apologize quite readily, and I personally feel like if just about anyone can turn up and and receive an apology from me, then it weakens, in my view, the currency of the apology to the one person I really do need to apologize to, which is which is my wife. So I, I just I'm adamant about the fact that, you know, no matter how people have been trying to blow things completely out of proportion and talk about, you know, sex trafficking and all sorts of things, no sex took place that wasn't between consenting adults. And the the thing that I did wrong was that I was unfaithful to my wife. And it's my wife who deserves an apology. And again, I think the vast majority of my viewers understand that. I'm never going to be able to satisfy every last person on Twitter, especially when a good number of people on Twitter very clearly have their knives out for me and just want to see me. It w I almost feel like they just want to see me destitute on the street or maybe even jumped off a bridge or whatever. They want to see me out of the picture altogether. They can jump up and down all they like about want demanding an apology, but I'm, I, I can only apologize when I do something wrong. And the person who deserves an apology in my mind is is my wife. It's, it's a tough one. It's, I, the, it's that conflation of like people trying to suggest you did something that you didn't and as you say it was only adults it's just that issue of of consent and the history of you know it with prostitution in thailand and i don't know too much about croatia we we you, you can never know and again i'm not i, I don't intend to moralize well I, the only thing i've ever said about sex workers was was regarding before going to thailand thailand th this is again and I, if you think about it there's there's a, a sort of i don't want to say kind of racism about it but 
you know, to, to suggest that this is all that can be said about Thailand. This is the last word on Thailand. And that's not to minimize that there aren't huge problems with sex trafficking in Thailand. But, to, you know, to suggest that when you go to Thailand, oh, well, it must be because of this. You know, it must be because of sex trafficking. Well, what you're, what you're doing then is, is you're, in a way, being incredibly condescending about an entire country. You know, I went to Thailand because I wanted to go to Asia for the first time and experience somewhere completely new and, in, to my mind, exotic. I wanted to go scuba diving. I wanted to experience the food, the culture, everything. It had absolutely nothing to do whatsoever with sex workers. Oh, or once you were there, you you then that the sex workers happened. But this is what I'm saying. People have have literally taken. Oh, he went to Thailand and and run away with this narrative. Okay, so that didn't happen. I've never exactly. I've never spoken about it. It was in Croatia. It was in other countries, in Croatia and other countries before I went to Thailand that I was unfaithful. Actually, when I went to Thailand, my wife and I were separated. So, the, but this is exactly what I mean. Pe people just kind of run away with these narratives and they forget that there's a real person at the bottom of all of this, a real person with, with a real private life and real children and real mental health problems. I, I don't mind telling you, I've, I've had to start taking antidepressants in just the last few weeks because it's been so overwhelming. And it feels like, as of now, things are starting to get a little bit more manageable and common sense is slowly starting to kick in and people are, I feel at least, starting to think, hang on, this this is a, a normal guy who's allowed to screw up from time to time and he doesn't deserve to be bullied like this. That's at least the perception I'm getting. And it's getting slowly more manageable to to deal with it all. Um, but you're you're writing what you said earlier that you know it, we, you know we're talking about mental health here, and and no one prepares you for 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 any of this when you when you first start making YouTube videos. Oh, by the way, one day when people type in your name in the YouTube search bar all of these videos are going to come up linking you with child grooming, um, sex trafficking, blah, blah, blah. It, 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 really, it really does a number on you. I, I would say at this point, like anyone listening or watching who's, who's, who's got the daggers out and the knives out right now, I would say, uh, you know, I feel that way about things a lot as well. We all do. We want to punish and things. We go, that person has done something bad. Let's kick them out of our tribe. And I, I would just say, let's try and be aware of that feeling inside us and go, okay, where does that come from? What place does that come from? And there is a human being at the end of it. And I'd, I'd always say, remember the human, you know, uh, I'm sounding quite culty now. Well, just just be kind, and and again, you know, we need to be able to hold people accountable. You know, when when people abuse their position and abuse their platform, um, and particularly when we're talking about cults that cover up crime and you know drive people to suicide through shunning and that kind of thing, you know, these these individuals and these organisations, we need to be holding them accountable. Um, but th that that culture of of accountability is never an excuse for bullying. It's, it's never an excuse for just rounding on an individual and shaming them over their private life. Um, because uh, you know, you, you mentioned before about legal action. I've actually um, instructed lawyers against a, a small number of creators who are making these videos. I, I very strongly feel, and, and it wasn't something I, I I undertook lightly. I just feel like, you know, thinking about future activists and people who kind of follow in my footsteps and and do the work after I'm gone. You you, you just cannot have a culture where anyone can say anything about anybody, uh, no matter how you know, defamatory and, and untrue and brutally um, horrible and, and just have no consequences whatsoever. And, and this just, oh, hey, it's just entertainment. It's just for YouTube. I, I think 
well, first of all, I think YouTube should be doing more so that you, people like me don't need to bring in the lawyers. But you know, if YouTube's not going to do anything, what what choice do I have? Because we're talking about ten years worth of of work, uh, really, really hard work that's in many cases come at the expense of spending time with my kids. I, I can't just let all of that burn um, because one or two people want to be able to put sensational stuff on their YouTube channel about me. I, I need to, I feel like I need to do something about it. And it all goes back to what I was saying earlier. I just don't handle bullies very well. It's, I should say as well, you know, you, you've been always been very, very nice to me when I was just starting out. You were my first ever patron. Um, and, and you still are. I don't know if you even remember, you're still a patron of mine. So I really respect and appreciate that and the help that you've given. And I imagine it can't just be me. You would probably help a lot of people. Um, with regards to what's going on, I'm also torn about what you, I mean, just from a tactical way, what you should have done or what you should do, because there's an argument that, you know, you could apologize and you could sort of go, hey, look, I have upset some people because it's obviously, you know, you are ex-Jehovah's Witnesses and we talk a lot about abuse and things. And you might think, that the you know the the prostitute stuff the sex worker stuff and i'm sorry for that and whatever and then another part of me thinks well there's a lot of there's been a lot of articles i've read about you know politicians shouldn't apologize it doesn't actually help it just it just shows people you were wrong and allows them to just go harder on you and so i guess you're caught between let me ask you what i'm wondering is when you called uh, your producers um kim and bob why did you tell them? I mean, and I ask that from a place of curiosity because obviously I'm writing this book at the moment about the psychology of secrets and why people are, are compelled to reveal things. And and you could have said, I need to take a short break. I'm having some issues with my marriage. Why did you tell them about the prostitutes? I, I ask myself that <laughs> constantly. Um, yeah, why, why did I confide in these individuals on, on such a private basis well I obviously regret doing it um I misjudged I I I I, I, I felt that I could trust these two people who I'd been working with for months uh working with you know quite closely and I felt like if I was going to be taking a long period away from my activism work to sort my head out I couldn't just kind of quit cold turkey and not let anyone who was working closely with me have a clue what was going on or what the what the reasons were. So I I know in my mind I know what was going through my mind when I had that conversation and again they were incredibly supportive at the time and um even even kind of arguing over who whose house I should come and stay at. Um but yeah, I, I, I feel like if one of the one of the biggest issues that I now have as a, in the wake of all of this kind of controversy is is that my trust in not just my fellow human beings but specifically ex Jehovah's Witnesses has been completely um, annihilated to the point where I'm really really going to struggle now to collaborate with other ex Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, due to this, which is a real shame because I actually think that people from cult backgrounds kind of coming together and collaborating and working together can achieve an awful lot and, and achieve some really beautiful things. Um, and it, it saddens me that I no longer have an appetite to do that, you know, with with other ex-Jehovah's Witnesses anywhere near like I used to. Um, but it's, it's just inevitable. I, when you... When you have your confidence violated in the way that I did, um, it makes it very, very difficult to trust people again. I suppose there's a mixture of people and there'll be those who just have the daggers out because they're jealous of you. They might want to replace you. They might just be tired of seeing the same guy. You know, I remember with celebrities, for example, David Beckham or whoever, once they get that big, we want to knock them back down. And then there are other people maybe who just have different morals to you and neither is right or wrong. You just see the world differently. And there'll be maybe the case was with, with your producers um, that they at the time didn't really take it in. And over the next few weeks, they it, it started to sort of contradict their morals 
and they thought, I can't keep this quiet and people are, you know, giving their patron money to you and supporting you in the same way they do to me. And, and maybe they thought they had a duty to get it get it out there. They think in a different way. Yeah, um, I'm glad you mentioned the Patreon money because that's actually something I wanted to talk about. But um, yeah, everyone everyone should be entitled to change their minds. Definitely, I agree with that. Um, so just because I I agree with what Andrew's doing one week um, doesn't mean that you know, a couple of weeks later, I don't actually, you know, think, hang, hang on, actually, I, I, what Andrew's doing is really, really shitty. Um, I think, I suppose if I did, if I did change my mind, though, I'd be upfront about it, and you'd, you'd know about it straight away. And I think if if people were to kind of see, you know, the things that were being said to me, and how supportive they were, like, for example, over WhatsApp, and what have you, right up to the point where we had a disagreement and then things started to deteriorate i think they'd, they'd be pretty shocked because the narrative that that there that kim has been sharing is that almost immediately upon me confronting her with my infidelity a, a, a pact was made so that they would both quit but they would first see me through my my crisis well that's nowhere in evidence in my view when you when you look at the the things that were said to me in the whatsapp exchanges and how supportive they were um there, there was no clue whatsoever that they had any kind of um moral issues or anything of, of, of that nature but as regards patreon and this is a good example, I think, of how, again, you know, facts can just fly out of the window and, and people can just spiral off it with with saying things that just aren't true. So one big narrative is, oh, he's used his Patreon money on sex workers. You know, he's used his Patreon money on, on Thailand. And one thing that I, I regret about my um, live stream, which I did, kind of very in a very reactionary state of mind and not a good state of mind to be addressing such important accusations you know one of the things i said was you know you know do doctors who who receive money for helping people do they have to account for every last thing they spend their money on and and i still feel that way i feel like it's either your job or it isn't and, you know, nobody should be chasing after you and asking for your receipts for how you spend your personal funds. But when it comes to Patreon money, I've always taken um, my patron pledges incredibly seriously and always um, reminded patrons that their funds are being churned back into the channel so that for example, I am upgrading my equipment, hiring a video editor, uh, expanding the studio. That's where the patron funds go. For 2021, uh, I think there were only two months in 2021 where the Patreon money was more than the Google ad revenue. So in other words, the Google ad revenue in 2021 was was the most substantial money coming through for my activism work. So nobody can say when it comes to me spending my money, my personal funds on a given thing, oh, he spent his Patreon money on this. No one can say that because actually I, I, it's not just Patreon money. It's the Google ad revenue. I also have two books, so I receive royalties from that, et cetera, et cetera. It's quite simply a lie to say, oh, Lloyd spent his Patreon money on this. But, but, but lies do a lot of damage, and I've lost well over 200 patrons since all of this. Each one was, would have been paying, what, three, three pounds? Well, let me just say this. Um, you know how long it takes to, to grow patron, Patreon. So, um, you know... 200 patrons, we were, we're talking about being knocked back over 12 months in terms of growing Patreon. And the last time I calculated it, I haven't done the latest numbers, but the last time I calculated it, it accounted for more than Tibor's wages, more than my video editor's wages in, in lost pledges. And 
and I, I can tell you that because when you do Patreon, you get the exit surveys through, don't you? And so you, people get to say, oh, "Oh, I've stopped pledging because of this." And so many people were saying, "Oh, I, I'm not, I, I'm not happy with you using my Patreon pledges for sex workers," or "I'm not." And so they 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 bought into this, but but by the time they've stopped pledging, the damage has been done. Um, and and I'm. I, 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 it's very difficult to to say. Actually, you're you're wrong about this. Do you mind do you mind pledging again? So it's, you'd end up in an argument with every one of them. It does complicate. Look, when when you make a living, as we both do, and many of us do, th- from people choosing to give money to us, even though it is for our work, um, it does complicate things. It muddies the waters. You're absolutely right. It's like, well, which bit of the money in the bank came from Patreon, and which from my other projects? Had I not received anything from Patreon, I might still have gone on and done all of those projects. But at the same time they're thinking I don't want to give money towards a person whose morals don't fit with mine and you could call that perhaps uh, what you call maybe consequence culture and it's something you know it's not nice um, because you don't feel you did with your morals you don't think you did anything wrong but they do and some of them are believing things that aren't true well I, I did again let me just stress I did do something wrong that's that I'm not saying I didn't do anything wrong I did do something wrong it was but it was against my wife and um, if if anybody started pledging um, Patreon pledges under the assumption that I don't make any mistakes in my personal life and I, I am a perfect person, then I, I think if they'd have asked me to begin with, I would have said, actually, you're probably best not pledging if, if it's on that basis. But, but fortunately, um, the majority of my patrons seem to be sticking around. In fact, one or two have, have actually joined because of what's happening. Um, I think most people can kind of grasp that because, just because I'm a flawed individual and um, have made mistakes in my personal life doesn't negate you know, my, my criticisms of, of an abusive cult that's tearing apart families and covering up child abuse. You know, I'm not precluded from, from commenting on any of those things. And to, to suggest otherwise, again, we, you know, we're, we're, we're entering bullying territory. We're, we're, we're talking about a group of people that just want to see someone burn. And, and I think that's a really, a really toxic uh, attitude to be cultivating. I would just say, though, that when, when, they are, when these people are saying, you know, they're upset about, you know, what you did, and you're saying, yes, I did something wrong to my wife, it was infidelity, and, you know, fine. I, th- I think we know that what they're saying is, no, it's not that, it's the sex workers. Now, you and I might not think there's morally an issue of sex workers, but they do. So that's, I think that's their issue, isn't it? That's what they want, some sort of apology. I haven't said there isn't an issue with sex workers. I, I think that there is definitely a conversation to be had with that. I, I just don't accept the premise that when you have sex with sex workers, you're no longer allowed to talk about the cover-up of child sexual abuse. I, 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 I struggle with with that line of reasoning. Well, let's say, imagine there's like somebody is the head of a charity against prost- prostitution and sex trafficking and stuff. You know, if somebody else is caught uh, having affairs with prostitutes, it's not really a big deal. If that person is, it becomes a big deal. So that's where they're, and again, I'm not saying that that you're, you know, but I can. That's where they're coming from, I think. Yeah. Well, I, again, if if people want to draw parallels between an organisation that keeps a database on individuals who sexually abuse children and someone who has visited sex workers, then they're free to do that. But I think most people can see the difference. You know, one one are people who. Um, one, one in one situation, we're talking about sex between between consenting adults where money changes hands, and in the other case, we're talking about children being raped. And and for me, the difference is night and day. So tell me, what? How is your mental state right now? I mean, even Kim, your producer, you know, you're having this big fight at the moment. She has said that she thinks she doesn't agree with how a lot of the community have reacted to you um she thinks it's over the top she's not comfortable with it at all it it is like for anyone listening it is mad some of the horrible things that are being said some of the bullying and pushing and punishing take us inside that that mind right now of yours well it's interesting that she's saying that now um 
I think it's a little bit late to be saying that after she's put things in motion. And um, I, I can't talk, I won't talk too much about that individual because I'm literally litigating against her. Um, but I think that anyone who who has been an ex-Jehovah's Witness and knows anything about the ex-Jehovah's Witness community knows that you know, we're a community of people carrying immense emotional baggage, um, immense hang-ups and taboos surrounding sex, uh, and no no shortage of judgmentalism. And you know, when when you start l- hurling accusations at someone, it's always going to snowball. It's always going to be difficult to keep restraint and stop things from spiraling out of control. Uh, uh, if, if, if all I'd had to deal with throughout all of this controversy was just the, the stuff that really did happen, just the factual stuff, that would have been invasive enough. What Kim Silvio did was so invasive, Andrew. I, I said at the time, I can't imagine feeling that much different if someone came into my home and burgled me. Um, at gunpoint and re- or rifle through my possessions in front of me. It, it's such an invasive thing to have your personal life dragged into the spotlight um, for what on, on whatever pretext. In the case of Kim Silvio, in the pretext of oh, this person needs to be outed, this person needs to be exposed. But then to have to deal with all of the other stuff, all of the th- stuff that's untrue, like I mentioned about Patreon funding and, um, you know, sex trafficking and all of those sorts of things, it's, it's hard enough dealing with the true stuff, but layer on all of, all of the defamation and all of the insinuation and all of the lies, it, it really has pushed me over the brink. And I, I think the only thing at this point that's, that's leading me to kind of continue is... It's just that I hate to see bullies win. Um, and and I have, you know, still so much support from my patrons. And it's clear from my viewers and the comments that are coming through on the channel that people believe in what I'm doing and want to see more of it. Um, but I, I've actually spoken to other creators who've been through similar to what I'm going through. Um, and it's left them shell, shell-shocked. And they're like... I, I spoke to one who's literally training to become a carpenter because that person wants to walk away at some point in the future completely from from creating content on YouTube because there's no protection. You know, one, once the mob decides that you need to be destroyed, you know, you just get torn to pieces and there's no there's no recourse. There's no way of... There's no kind of independent arbiter on youtube who you can go to and say you know you know you know these dozens of videos that are that are accusing me of child grooming do you mind taking those down there's there's no way of doing that and and the internet doesn't forget the internet remembers and i've got two kids uh one's just had her third birthday the other is seven um at some point in the future they're gonna have to deal with all of this stuff that's floating around online and all I can do right now is do what I'm doing, which is hire my lawyers and hope that at some point in the next few years, you know, the people who are doing this are, are held accountable so that I can point to, to them and say, look, I, you know, they did this, I responded, and here's the outcome. Um, but it's a really, really difficult thing to go through. And it, it, it's all, again, just boils down to just a lack of kindness and, and a lack of basic human empathy and compassion. It's its a real shame. Has it changed at all? Because um, we, we've spoken a tiny bit before about how you, you've often had views that are a little bit more on the progressive, dare I say, woke side. Just a, nothing extreme either way. Uh, has it changed a little bit how you feel about cancel culture and consequence culture, especially with regards to the bullying? You know, has it given you a new insight? I've, I, I, I like to think I've always had, had a nuanced view. Um, I'm against orthodoxy. So I, I'm against like um, a mob, you know, of an unknown, unaccountable individuals kind of just floating around on Twitter 
um, just deciding amongst themselves that, that there's this kind of dogma that people need to stick to and, and destroying people who don't, who don't sign up to that. Um, I am very much about principles and very much about social justice and very much about equality. Um, and if that makes me woke, <laughs> fair enough. Um, but I, I like to think that my, my position is nuanced when it comes to council culture. So I think that like with anything, anything, almost anything can be weaponized. Almost anything can be taken to an extreme. Um, and woke culture can be taken to an extreme and can be weaponized and can be perverted. But for me personally, you know, the general um, incentive behind woke culture and behind cancel culture, I think that for the majority, the incentive is, is to create a kind of more tolerant and understanding world. It's just a shame that one or two individuals ruin things by inevitably taking things to extremes. Um, so that, I guess that's all I'd say on that. How are you going to be, Lloyd? How, how are you? How, what's going to happen now? Um, it's just a case of taking each day as it comes. I'm definitely in a better place now than I was, I would say, two or three weeks ago. The antidepressants are helping. Um, I'm told that it takes a month for you to start to feel effects. But I, I like to think that in terms of no longer feeling just the overwhelming despair, um, I like to think that I've turned a corner already, or at least I hope so. Um, there's still no shortage of stuff to talk about in terms of Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, as of now, despite all of this sustained uh, attack on patreon and what have you i still we can still operate our business we can still pay tibor um so it's just about um carrying on uh, as best we can um again it's the the biggest challenge i think has been trying to sort through my own mental health and specifically my personal um issues in my family with all of this noise going on in the background. And that's very much ongoing and I think has probably been um, stunted due to everything that's been happening. It, it's definitely made it harder going and slower to deal with, in my opinion, that more important ish part, you know, side of my life. And so I, I guess it's a bit too early to say where, where the chips have fallen in, in that department, but I think broadly speaking, I feel like I'm, um, I feel, I, I hope I've hit rock bottom. <laughs> it's one of those things where when you're going through it, you think, oh, now I've hit rock bottom and then you fall again and oh, okay. Oh no, I'm falling again. And I, I, I hope, I hope touch wood that I've, I've hit rock bottom and it's upwards from here. I hope so too. And if you need any uh, example of of somebody who can overcome that stuff, look no further than Sean Atwood, who I, you know I do his show on Wednesdays. Uh, he just, I mean, he just lives with it. Because I was thinking as well, like, oh, I would say something, you know, tedious like, uh, well, time's a healer, Lloyd. It'll be all right. But time's not really a healer on YouTube because in 10 years, people will still be writing comments, will still be having a go. Some people just because they feel like it. And Sean still gets those because he's got, 700,000 subscribers or whatever. So he's always got people doing it and you just go, oh, there's a troll, get him out. There you go. And he just smiles and gets on with it. So hopefully at some point you'll be able to feel that way about it. Maybe, is that the best case scenario? Best case scenario for me is that, yeah, I, I can, I, I'll make a few more videos. Um, I've still got things to say, but I, I kind of dream of one day um, just being uh, in glorious isolation, you know, like um, <laughs> you know, like uh, in the new Star Wars trilogy where Luke's on this island. That that's just my dream of just being on an island somewhere and just being in glorious isolation and maybe just writing books because I'm I'm a writer. You know, I've written two books and I, I'd love to to just be a writer and maybe have a boat and go fishing at weekends and that's. That, and, and being with my family, you know, um, having time for my family, that's basically my dream. And it's good to have something to work towards, even if I'm not there yet. How Are your family all right? Um, yeah. Yeah. It's, again, 
it's been incredibly challenging for all of us. And when I say all of us, I mean, including, you know, the children, um, because it's impossible to shield children completely. You, you do your best as a parent when there's a crisis going on, but it's impossible to completely shield your children when, when things are really, really bad. And uh, I'm sure Jessica will have memories from this period where in the future, when she's older, she's like, ah, yeah, I remember that, you know? Um, it's, it's very, very painful. Um, but again, in the context of, of the wider world and what's happening at the moment, we, we could be in a far, far worse situation. And it's one of those things where, 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 you, where you see children's hospitals being bombed. Um, it, it puts things in perspective. You know, we, we did a drive to the border with Ukraine-Hungary border to pick up some refugees and that sort of thing again it just puts things in perspective you know we have a we have a roof over our heads we're not in any kind of existential fear of 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 bombs landing you know in our front room and um yeah i think it's it's good to be grateful for what you have you know i like that i like that and again i would i, I know i already said this but i mean there will be people who are out to get you who are watching this i imagine or listening to this and i would just say again think about if you're going to write something on twitter if you're going to be angry and you're, you know, think about where that urge comes from and, and what it will achieve uh for anyone for yourself and for lloyd and you know the where and the why and remember the human um so yes and i i hope you you know get back to doing what you do best lloyd and all the, you know all the J jw xjw stuff um you're, you're a leading light of, among youtubers and uh thank you for coming on the show thanks andrew i really appreciate it Hi, I'm Andrew Gold, former BBC journalist. I got a little tired of restrictions over who I could interview and what I could say and do, so I made this channel. Click this playlist here, and I'll be seeing you on the edge.